In this video, I would like to show you a nice and simple way of expressing linear subspaces in Rn algebraically. It's just a tiny bit different from what we've done so far. And the difference is that it's a little bit more direct and a little bit more explicit. And as I will explain, having an approach that's a little bit more direct and explicit is better in the context of decomposition. So let's start with the very first subspace of Rn that we encountered in this chapter. And it was a subspace in R3, and it was characterized by the linear property that the middle entry equals zero. Now I would say there are three ways to express this property. The first way is to do it with words. You can simply say consider all elements of R3 whose middle entry is zero. That's a perfectly valid description, and it gives you a great test for a potential target vector in a decomposition to determine whether the decomposition is possible in the first place by determining whether the target vector is in the subspace of the decomposition vectors or not. And having a verbal description is great. This particular verbal description tells you to look at the middle entry of the target vector to see whether it's zero, and if it is zero, then the target vector is within the span of the decomposition vectors and decomposition is possible. And if it's not, then it's not within the span and decomposition is impossible, which was the logic we used in that video. Okay, great. So expressing the property with words is great because it directly translates into an algorithm for testing whether the target vector is within the span or not. And Words are great even if your ultimate goal is to come up with an algebraic expression. Before you ever come up with an algebraic expression, you should first find a way, if possible, to state the property with words. It's just a very good step to go through for your understanding. And even in another context where you may be reading a book and you encounter a mathematical expression that describes something, it's always best to translate that into words because words, we're just much better at understanding words than we are at under understanding algebraic expressions. So words is always the first step and sometimes it's the best way to express something. But we also like algebraic expressions because they're better for writing computer code and they're also much more compact and have other advantages. So now how do we translate these words into an algebraic expression that would capture this linear property. Here is how we did it so far. We would write that this vector consists of entries a, b, and c. We would simply give them names and then translate what we said before into an expression like this. And this is kind of saying consider all elements of R3 such that the middle entry is zero. So this is how we've done it until now algebraically. Also a pretty good way except it's not quite as explicit as our words were, as our words were. Because first we write down this vector, and then later we write down the relationship that A, B, and C need to satisfy in order to satisfy the property. Not a bad way, but not a very explicit way. So here is just a tiny difference that I think makes a significant psychological difference. Instead of writing this, let's just write directly what's allowed in the vector. Let's put all of the information that we know about these vectors right into the vector itself. And I'm going to use Greek letters just so that alpha and beta and gamma are not confused with A, B, and C. But you can use the same letters. You can use any letters you choose. But here's what I would do. I would put a zero in here explicitly and say middle entry is zero. I don't think there is a better way of saying that we're only considering vectors whose middle entry is zero, then putting an explicit zero right into this expression, right into this vector. And then I'm saying that the first entry can be anything at all, and alpha represents anything at all. Once again, you can use a, let's say the first entry can have any value. Uh, I prefer using Greek letters. Uh, I don't know why. Okay, and then the last entry, equals, well, I don't have to go to gamma because I haven't used beta yet. So beta. So here's why I like this approach. Because I look at it 
and it translates into words very readily. I'm looking at it and I, and I say to myself, this is a vector where the middle entry is zero and the other two entries can be whatever we want them to be. So that's why I prefer this way. It's much closer to describing the property or equivalently the linear space with words. That's why I like this way. And it's better for decomposition because by looking at this, it makes it a little bit easier to match it up with a potential target vector and to determine whether the target vector belongs to the subspace described by this expression. Let's move on to the second one. Do you remember what it was? The second one was consisted of vectors where the second entry was five times the first. Well, let's write it explicitly. Instead of writing a, b, and then, send, and then saying that b equals 5a, we can simply write alpha, 5 alpha. This just says alpha can be any number, but whatever number this is, the second entry will be five times that. Once again, the slight advantage is the directness of this approach. And then the third entry can be whatever we want. And again, you will find that when you take this approach, and actually with the other algebraic approach as well, there are usually many ways, usually infinitely many ways, to describe the same subspace with an expression. There are infinitely many expressions that will capture the same subspace. I'll give you examples of that later. Well, let me give you an example of that now. For example, I could have called this entry alpha and this entry one-fifth alpha, and it would say the exact same thing, as long as the interpretation of alpha is that it can be any number. Our final example, before we considered one more, our final example was the most interesting of the bunch, and it was characterized by the property that the middle entry was the average of the other two. So what better way to express it than to say the first entry can be anything you want. The last entry can be anything you want. But the middle entry needs to be the average of the other two. That's perfect. And then you see that this is almost an explicit recipe for testing whether some vector belongs to this space or not. For example, consider a vector 11, 15, 19. If I try to match it up with this pattern, I would have to say, well, alpha must be 11 and beta must be 19. Then let's see what the middle entry is. Well, it has to be the sum of the other two divided by two. So 11 plus 19, 30, divided by two, 15. So indeed, this vector matches this pattern. So in this case, it was pretty easy. In the case of more complicated subspaces, it may not be so easy, but I really like this approach. And I just want to mention that there are, of course, other ways of expressing this. You could have said alpha, beta, and then probably two beta minus alpha. If you can try it, that would work also. But that's not as good because that would, have, would be harder to express in words. This is very nice because you look at it and you immediately say what I'm seeing here is that the middle entry is the average of the other two. Finally, we considered one more linear subspace that in addition to having the middle entry equal zero was also characterized by the fact that this entry was, I believe, four times, that's right, four times the first entry. The way we captured it previously was to write down A, B, C, and then we wrote b equals zero. Let me just remind you. b equals zero and c equals 4a. I believe that's what it was. And these had to be simultaneously satisfied. But I think that the following way is better. Isn't it better to write alpha, zero, four alpha? And you look at this vector and it just tells you I consist of any number, followed by a zero, followed by four times whatever the first number was. So once again, the difference from what we did before is pretty subtle, but sometimes subtle differences make significant impacts. So this is the way that I advocate you try to capture 
linear subspaces in Rn in this course, including in all of the exercises that you should do next.